easy. And uh, we also want to pray for Jill, who lost her husband in this death, uh, very young he was, and is only in his 50s. And uh, also we want to pray for uh, a man, Joe, who's in the hospital. He delivers Pepsi-Cola and different other things, and he's one of our people listens to us from the state of California. And a thousand pounds of bottles fell on him one time as he was transferring from one truck to another. Broke many of his bones. He's in the hospital. He's got his phone with him, so maybe he's listening to us today as well. Way over there in California. And Joe Fascio is his name, so please pray for him as well. Finally got to the right page. All right, let's go to read together uh, Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, we believe that uh, Paul is the author of Hebrews. Sorry, pe many people do not. We have about five reasons for that. Full Paul wrote to the Jews in the dispersion in 2 Peter 3.15. He says, account for the long suffering of our uh, under salvation as a beloved brother Paul also has written unto you. So he's talking to the Jews. That's the first question and comment. Now, style is a, 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 the way of Paul. This is method. In Hebrews 13, 23, he says, Know ye, uh, our brother Timothy is set up at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. That's his, Paul's style. A third reason why I believe it's Paul is that uh, uh, he knew the saints in Italy. Well, Rome is in Italy, the prisons in Italy, possibly the ones he led to the Lord. He talks about that. Uh, Hebrews 13, 24, salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints that be of Italy salute you. And then the fourth and final reason, uh, fourth reason rather, he knew uh, something about bonds, and where he was in bonds in prison. In Hebrews 10, 34, you have compassion of me and my bonds. Hebrews 13, 3, remember them that are in bonds. And uh, first, the first, fifth reason, Paul the traditional text before the critics came along to criticize, that was in the old Schofield Bible, Paul was the author. It's in the text of Septus Greek itself that Paul was the author. Even though it's not in the scriptures that Paul wrote it, we believe Paul did write it. And we said this verse number one. In these last days, uh, verse number one, he spoke to the fathers in the Old Testament by the prophets. In Jeremiah 7:23, for example, this commanded he them, obey my voice and I will be your God. You shall be my people. Walk in my ways that I commanded you. But they hearkened not. The Old Testament Hebrews did not hearken to the Lord. And then since the days your fathers came forth to the land of Egypt, unto this day I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, Old Testament prophets, daily rising up early and sending them, yet they hearkened not unto me, or inclined their ear. Let's read verse number two together. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath anointed, heir of all things, by whom he also he made the world. Notice two things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. He's spoken to us by the Son. It says in the Gospel of John, the Lord Jesus said to his apostles, I have many things yet to speak unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he that is risen, and then the Holy Spirit of God will make known to him, he shall not speak of himself. The Lord Jesus will speak of himself. The Holy Spirit will not speak of himself, but he'll testify of me and bring to your remembrance all things that he's spoken unto me. So the Lord Jesus gave all his words to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave them to the writers of the New Testament, according to that verse, and they gave them unto us. So the Lord Jesus is the author of the New Testament, and by extension, we be the Old Testament also. And uh, he is the one spoken unto us by his Son in the New Testament. Now notice whom he hath appointed in verse 2, heir of all things. He is the heir. Nobody can take that heirship away from him, not the devil, not anybody else. Heir. And notice also, he's also the co-creator. Uh, he hath appointed heir, and by whom also he made the heavens, the worlds. Two things. Let's see some verses on the heirs of the Lord Jesus. Matthew 21, 38, for example. When the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, 
and let it seize on the inheritance. An heir takes care of all the things that have been inherited to them. They want to seize on the inheritance. Then in Romans 8, 17, if children, talking about genuine Christians not today, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs, everything the Lord Jesus has, every genuine Christian also has himself. Joint heirs with the Lord Jesus. Then Galatians 4, verse 7. Thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Every genuine Christian is an heir through the Lord Jesus. If you're a genuine Christian, not a fake and phony Christian, not just saying I'm a Christian from the head, not the heart. Many Christians call themselves Christians. They're no more saved than a rat. But genuine Christians are really genuinely heirs of God through salvation, through faith, genuine faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Titus 3 and verse 7, being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs according to the hope. Then in Hebrews 1 and verse 14, are they not ministering spirits, that is the angels, sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? I believe every genuine Christian has an attending angel. They say, are they going to run out of angels? No, thousands and thousands, millions God has created these angels. The Lord Jesus has created the angels, and they're helping those that are genuine Christians, whatever need they may have, ministered to them who shall be the heirs of salvation. And notice also in verse 2, by whom, by whom, through whom, the God the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ, made the world, the great creator. For instance, in Mark 10, or in verse 6, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Not male and male, female and female. This whole stuff of changing sexes going on and on and increasing through the years in our country, definitely sin and wickedness and corruption. God made them. The Lord Jesus, with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, created them male and female. Those are the genders. We've got to stick to the genders according to the Scripture. Then in John 1 and verse 3, we know this, we'll say it together. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The Lord Jesus Christ is spoken of here, the creator, by him. Nothing was created except through him. And then in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 9, neither was the man created for the woman. Notice that. Man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Man needed a helpmate, and so God took from the rib and created woman. A lot of times things are changed. In homes, a lot of things are changed. And instead of the man being in charge and in charge of the home, the women many times take over. That's not scriptural. Man first, a husband to love the wife as Christ loved the church. The woman's to be in, a, woman's to be in subjection to her own husband. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, we know this one, so let's say it together. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And then in Galatians 6, 15, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Now the Lord Jesus is not only the creator of physical things, but new creatures. Everyone that's born again, born anew, he's a new creature created in the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Lord Jesus Christ as well. In Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we perhaps know this one, that's it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. By grace you're saved by faith, but we're to walk in them after we're saved, good works. Not good works in order to obtain salvation at all as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say. Then Ephesians 3 and verse 9, to make all men see what's the fellowship and the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Those three words are knocked out of the Gnostic fake text in Egypt, Egypt, Alexandria, Egypt. They're knocked out of all the modern versions because the Gnostic didn't believe that Jesus could do anything. He was just a man. He was born of a regular man. He died just like all the people died. Didn't sit, die on the cross for our sins. And so the Gnostics influenced in Alexandria, Egypt, all these texts, these Greek texts. So the modern verse, wipe it out. They stopped. Created all things, period. No, 
all things by Jesus Christ. He is the co-creator with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, verse 24, and that he put on the new man, which God is, which after God is created in righteousness, true holiness. The Lord Jesus had a part in the true creatures as well, the new man created. And then in Colossians 1, in verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, was the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Notice verse number 16. For by him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, were all things created. The Son was I had a part with the Father and the Holy Spirit. All things, the Creator, that are in heaven, in earth, visible, invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things created by him and for him. By the Lord Jesus, for the Lord Jesus. And then verse 17, and he is before all things. From all eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was. And all things by him, all things consist. That is, hang together so they don't fly apart. The powerful Savior keeps all things in their place. In Colossians 3 and verse 10, and you put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So the Lord Jesus is part in the creation, the new creation of genuine Christians in their new life. Then in James 1 and verse 18, of his own will he got he us with the word of truth that we should be kind of the first fruits of his creatures. So in, in the spiritual realm, the Lord Jesus created also those that are genuine Christians as well, a creation of spiritual creation. Then in 1 Peter 4 and verse 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. The Lord Jesus being a creator again. And uh, according to his will, if we suffer according to God's will, and may there be many more sufferings come in these days of genuine Christians. It's a sad thing, but we just look out for it. And according to the will, commit the keeping of your souls to the Lord. And then Revelation 4 and verse 11. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things. The Creator is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And for Thy pleasure they are and were created. In Revelation 10, verse 6, And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and things that are therein, speaking of the Lord Jesus again, and the earth and things that therein are, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. Then let's go to verse number three. Let's read it together. Who being in the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now those are four things in this verse that want to ask many verses in regard to it. First, he's got great glory, the glory of the Lord. Uh, second, he's a sustainer of the universe. He has great power. Uh, third, he's the redeemer. He redeemed us who are genuinely saved. And fourth, he's seated in honor. First verse is on Christ's glory, some 15 verses on that. For instance, in Matthew 25 and verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him shall he sit on the throne of his glory. Two phases of the Lord's coming. First phase is the rapture, snatching away into heaven all that are genuinely saved. After that, seven years of tribulation on this earth, the Antichrist ruling. After the seven years, that great uh, battle of Armageddon. And after that, his feet shall stand in the Mount of Olives. They'll cleave so the, the seas can go through. And he'll put down all that uh, suffering and all that battle of Armageddon he set up his kingdom 1,000 years from that time to the other. This is his, his second phase of his coming, set up on the throne of his glory. And then righteousness will reign. Not sinfulness like it's reigning today all over the world, but righteousness. Then in Luke 9, verse 32, Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. This was in the garden of Gethsemane. And when they were awake, they saw his glory. Right there on his earth, some parched, and the two men that stood with him. 
And then in John 1, 14, we know this one. If we do, let's say it together. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Then in John 2, 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifested his glory. Every miracle that he did manifested the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, perfect God and perfect man. Then in John 17, verse 5, in his high priestly prayer to the Father, and now, O Father, he prayed, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Prayer for glory. Then in John 17, 22, again, in his high priestly prayer, the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, the genuine Christian believers, and that they may be one even as we are. Sad to say, many are not one. They're not genuine, united, but they're torn apart, sad. But he prayed for the unity of genuine believers, genuine Christians, unity of the faith. Then John 17, 24, again, the Lord Jesus to his Father, the high priestly prayer, Father, I will also that they whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. We buried Albert Severance the other day, and uh, in the service I didn't preach the whole thing, but I gave a testimony and we had prayer. I mentioned John 14, where the Lord Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, all the genuine Christians. If I go, prepare a place for you, shall come again, and you'll see me as a... And so he prepared a place. They may behold my glory. The Lord answered that prayer, and will answer when we go home to be with him, to show and see his glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Then in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If the princes and the rulers of Rome would have known who he was, they wouldn't have crucified him. But they didn't know the Lord of glory. He veiled his glory while on earth. Otherwise, people would die for the brightness of it. Just like when Moses went up to the Mount Sinai and came down and had to cover his face because of the glory of God. And then uh, in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, we're in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, as we look at the scriptures, the word of God, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. And then Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, whereunto he called you by, for our, by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we don't have, don't have much glory here, some do more than others. But when we got our new bodies transformed for genuine Christians, we'll see our glorious resurrected bodies in, in heaven. Then in Hebrews 2 and verse 9, we see Jesus, who's made a little lower than the angels. That is, when he came to this earth, he was perfect God, perfect man. But as a genuine human man, perfect man, he's lower than the angels. That's what he was. But for the sufferings of death, that's why he was made a little lower than the angels. The suffering of death. So that he was perfect God and perfect man so he could take the sins of the world, the suffering of death, then crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. I don't believe in Calvinism where they say he just died for the elect. No. Every man, every person, every human being, he died for the sins of all of us. And the hyper also say that if you're not one of the elect, you can't be saved. Christ didn't die for your sins. He did die for the sins of all, that everyone who trusts him might be saved. And then uh, in James 2 and verse 1, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory with respect to persons. He's the Lord of glory. And then in 1 Peter 1 and verse 21, Who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory, glorious Savior that your faith and hope might be in God. And then 2 Peter 1.17, He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration. He was glorified. The Old Testament saints, two of them, one on the right, one on the left, they saw the glory. 
This is my beloved Son, uh, in whom I am well pleased. I wish all the world to be well pleased with the Lord Jesus, as the Father was. In Revelation 5 and verse 12, one of the angels sang with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Notice I want you to see a second thing in this verse, number three, upholding all things, his power. Not only did God the Father and God the Son create all things, but they're sustaining these things. Do you wonder why the, our, the stars don't fly all over the world and everything else just goes to, place, to pieces? It's the Lord Jesus Christ who sustains that creation that he made, sustaining, upholding all things with his power. For instance, in Luke 4 and verse 36, they were amazed because with authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits that came out of him. Power to have the spirits leave him. Power of miracles while he was here on earth, the Lord Jesus. In Luke 9 and verse 43, again, they were all amazed at the mighty power of God, but while they wondered every one of these things, which Jesus did, wondering and amazing the miracles that he performed while he was here on this earth. And then in Luke 21 and verse 27, and when they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Again, this is the second phase of his coming, not the rapture. No one except the genuine Christians will even say him or understand. He comes in the clouds, snatched up all genuine Christians. But after the tribulation of seven days, he shall come with great glory, and then he will come to this earth. They will see him then. Uh, the first phase of his coming, when the rapture takes place, the genuine Christians are caught up. People who knew us will wonder, where did they go? They're gone. But the second phase, you come onto this earth with power and great glory. And then in Acts 10 and verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. The Lord Jesus on this earth had great power. Went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed, uh, of the devil, for God was with him. Then in Romans 1, verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power. He's a powerful Savior. And then uh, in 1 Corinthians 1, and verse 24, them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. He's the power of God. And then in Philippians 3, and verse 10, Paul says from prison, it's a prison letter, Philippi, prisoner. He says that I may know him, Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. You know, they're building 30 or 40 different FEMA camps to put genuine Christians in, you know. There are going to be two questions asked. Do you believe in all the nonsense of the Antichrist and agree with him? You're going to do everything, or you don't. You want to follow the Lord Jesus. Those that follow the Lord Jesus, there's a red and there's a blue, different groups, sent to FEMA camps to put us into death. And so be ready if you're a genuine Christian. The power of God. Though know him, the fellowship of his sufferings, conformable unto his death. Then in Colossians 2 and verse 10, and you're complete. In him, those who are genuine Christians, which is the head of all principality and power. All these in power today, whether in this government or other governments of the world, the Lord Jesus is still in power, greater than all the power of these people upon this earth. And then Colossians 1 and verse 17. He is before all things, eternally, always here, always eternal God. And by him all things again consist or hold together. There's a third thing in this verse number 3. Very clear. And by himself purged our sins. Purged our sins by himself. Not with the Pope of Rome, not with sanctification by the saints, not with prayers, not with good works. By himself. And by himself, by the way, it, it's taken away, and that where it belongs from these Gnostic critical Greek texts, it's taken away from all the new versions as well. By himself is gone. He purged our sins by himself. That's the title of our message this morning. In John 11 
in verse 50, some 12 verses on Christ purging our sins. Consider that it is expedient for us that one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, should die for the people, all the people, not simply the elect, but all the people, and that the whole nation perish not. If they trust the Lord Jesus Christ, they will not perish. In Romans 5 and verse 8, we know this, we'll say it together. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. The whole national people, every one of us, from Adam right on through the end, Christ died in our place for us, for our sins. We must remember and must agree with God that we're sinners. If you're not sinners, why do you have to have a Savior? Agree or I'm a sinner? Then you have to realize the Lord Jesus died in our place for our sins, took our sin in his own body. Then you must trust and receive him, believe on him genuinely as your Savior. Died for us. That makes you a genuine Christian, and only that. In Romans 8.32, <clears throat> We know this one, let's say it together. <clears throat> he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Then in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, Purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, the old the poison of sin, as ye are unleavened. Even Christ our Passover again is sacrificed for us. Everyone in this world, not simply for some group of little people, tiny elect group of the whole world. But the provision is made for us, the whole world, but not the possession. You can't say universalism. That's false and heretical. Everyone is not saved in this world. Just because Christ provided for their salvation and died for their sins, they must trust him. And then it makes it their own. Receive him as their savior. And then in Romans 8 and verse 32, Romans 8 and verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, the whole world, <clears throat> how shall not with him also freely give us all things? And purge out the old leaven, Christ our Passover. Then in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, <clears throat> I delivered unto you what I received. Again, Christ died for our sins by himself, saved us, and delivered took our sins upon his, in, his, in his body. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made, that is God the Father, hath made him, the Lord Jesus, sin for us in our place, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God <clears throat> in him. And then in Galatians 1 and verse 4, uh, it says, Who gave himself for our sins. The Lord Jesus gave himself for our sins in our place. In Ephesians 5 and verse 2, Walk in love as Christ has loved us, and <clears throat> given himself for us, and offering and sacrifice, given himself for us in our place. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 10, again, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us in our place. And Titus 2 and verse 14, <clears throat> who gave himself, the Lord Jesus, for us the whole world, that we might trust him and be saved. In 1 John 2 and verse 2, he's a propitiation for our sins, Christian sin, but not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then 1 John 4 and verse 10, <clears throat> Here in his love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, satisfaction for our sins. Very important that we see that. Then the fourth thing in this first three is that he's seated at the right hand of the Father up in heaven, the Lord Jesus is. <clears throat> there are about 16 verses that talk about this. Two of them change the wording just a little. I want you to notice that, how it's changed. For instance, uh, in Mark 16, verse 19, the last 12 verses of Mark are omitted by most of these modern versions, English and other versions. So that after the Lord spoken unto them, was received up in the glory, and sat on the right hand of God. He seated at the Father's right hand, uh, a place of blessing, a place of exaltation. Then in Luke 20, verse 42, another verse, David said, Sit thou on my right hand to the Lord Jesus. In Luke 22:69. 69, 
Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit the right hand of God the Father. The place of honor. In Acts 2, in verse 32, <clears throat> being at the right hand of God, exalted. He Acts 2, in verse 34, <clears throat> David said, the Lord said, Sit unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. But in Acts chapter 7, it's changed. Just two verses out of 15. It's different. Why is it different? <clears throat> because this is the murder, the first martyr of the Christian church. Stephen was killed at that time. And he, say, he said, I see Jesus at the right hand. He was raised up and he died a martyr's death. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly unto heaven, <clears throat> saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing, not sitting, at the right hand of God. Why was he standing? He was waiting for Stephen to come up to see him. Yes. Standing. He was seated because his work was finished. Yes. Now the first martyr. There have been many other martyrs since then. There been many more hundreds and thousands of martyrs in this day as well. Then again, in Acts 7, 56, and Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, not sitting, welcoming the first martyr. And he welcomed us, or genuinely saved, I'm sure as well. Then in Romans 8 and verse 34, who is he that condemneth? Christ that died? No. Even he that is at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. The Lord Jesus is making intercession for genuine Christians, interceding as our high priest. <clears throat> Which he wrought in God, Ephesians 1 and verse 20. Who raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly place. He set him down. He was seated once again. And then in Colossians 3 and verse 1. Uh, if he then be risen with Christ. Okay, thank you, Anna. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. All right, I'm going to put this here for now. Then I'll take it a little bit later. Hebrews 1, 3, who being the brightness of his glory, that is the Lord Jesus, and express image of his person, uh, and upholding all things with the word of his power, when he had by himself, by himself, purged our sins. That's removed from all the modern versions. They don't want it. The Gnostics didn't believe it. So these false Greek versions take it out. But it was only by himself purged and cleansed us from sin and then sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Then in Hebrews 1, and verse 13, But what to which of the angels said, uh, Sit thou on my right hand? No, the angels said that to he, they said to them. Then in Hebrews 8, and verse 1, Now the things that he has spoken is the sum. We have such an high priest, sat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens. Then Hebrews 10, and verse 12, this man, the Lord Jesus, after he had by himself offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Then in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, according, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, who for the joy that was set before him, I wouldn't think the cross would be joy, but he didn't mean that joy, that by his death he could welcome into the heavenly places, all those who genuinely trust him as their Savior, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, the place of honor. And 1 Peter 2, and verse 22, he's gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, exalted. Let's read together verse number 5, or number 4, rather being made so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now the Lord Jesus in all this, verse number three and one and two, you see his glory, you see his power, all these things. Verse four sums it up much better than the angels. That includes Satan, you know. And when he was tempted in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, the old devil thought he had a little bit of edge on our savior. I get to him, and he commanded three different commands. Do this, do this, do this. Lord Jesus, 
No, no, no. Quoted scripture to it. Lord Jesus, even on this, even when he was on this earth, had more power than any angel, including Lucifer, Satan, the devil. As he by inheritance had obtained a more excellent name than they. He was the Son of God and God the Son. More an excellent name. As far as some of the verses on angels, in Psalm 68 and verse 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels, thousands and thousands of angelic beings, helpers of the Lord. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai and the holy place. Then in Matthew 26 and verse 53, before the cross, they ask him, what about different things, Lord Jesus? He told them, thinkest thou not that I can now pray my Father if I wanted to? And he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Thousand and legions, that's 12,000 angels who could well deliver him from the cross of Calvary. He said, not my will but thine be done. If he did not be willing to die on that cross for the sins of the whole world, not a single person on this earth could be saved, born again, be made a genuine Christian at all. And then in Mark 1 and verse 13, And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan. We mentioned that earlier. Three different temptations. The old devil <coughs> was with the wild beasts. First thing that Satan says, tell these stones to be made into bread. He quoted scripture. He could have done it, but he did not abuse the miraculous powers that he had. Uh, Tempted of Satan, the wilderness, with the wild beasts, and angels ministered unto him. The angels helped him during those 40 days. They ministered to his needs, took care of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then 1 Peter 3 and verse 22, speaking of the Lord Jesus, who has gone into heaven, so in the right hand of God, again, the right hand of majesty and power and honor, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Again, he's the, the leader, the angels subject unto him. Then in verse number five, let's read that together. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I would be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. None of the angels said, this day I would begotten thee, but to the son. Now, a lot of people mistakenly think that this day I would begotten thee. He wasn't begotten, wasn't even made until the father said these words somewhere in the scriptures. No, I believe it's true that he was from all eternity to all past to all eternity to future. No beginning, no ending. But the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, somewhere in eternity, decided there would be a relationship and there would be a Father and a Son and the Holy Spirit. And there was a relationship, the begotten. At one time, the Father and Son made that relationship so the Father is the Father, the Son is the begotten Son. This day, begotten. If God be to him a Father, he shall be to me a Son. The relationship. It was the Father that sent the Son into the world. They're co-equal. None of them is more superior than the other, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But the Son was obedient to the Father. He was sent to the wicked world, leaving the glory and sinless and, and power of heaven to come to seek and to save that which was lost. Lived for 33 years, and finally they nailed him to a cross that he might, by genuine faith in him, bear the sins of the whole world in his body on the tree that by genuine faith in him we might be born again, saved, become genuine Christians. So this day have I begotten. This day now you're my son and I'm your father. In Psalm 2 and verse 6, for example, Yet have I sent my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Thou art my son, and the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten. His father and son relationships between the two two persons of the, of the Trinity. Then Acts 13, verse 33. God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Raised 
bodily from the dead after dying for the sins of the world, all of us. And then in Hebrews 1 and verse 5, For out of which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I'll be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. We heard that earlier. But then in Hebrews 5 and verse 5, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. It was the Father that made the Lord Jesus high priest. Let's read verse number 6 together. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. To worship by the angels was commanded of God when he brought them, the Lord Jesus into the world. For instance, Psalm 97, verse 7. Confounded be all they that serve graven images, those idolaters that boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all ye gods. And the word for gods uh, in the Old Testament many times refers to the angels. Worship the angels in this particular instance in this Psalm 97. Then let's read verse number 7 together. And of the angels it saith, who make his angels spirits and his ministers of flame and fire. Angels are ministers, servants, not dictators and lords. Remember where that other earlier verse says ministers are those that will be heirs of salvation. They're ministers of genuine believers, genuine Christians. I wonder if you've ever had an almost accident, almost fell, almost hit a car, almost having a car hit you. Uh, I've had some of these things, and I'm wondering if that's one of the angels, my angel. Stop that accident from happening. Stop that car. Let me get out before it hit. All these things, the angels minister and serve those that are genuine Christians that are here on this earth. That's one of their ministries, one of their duties that God has sent them to, just like they ministered uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, this is just the beginning of Hebrews. We look forward to taking the entire book now, verse by verse, as days come up. And we're glad that you're here for us to listen to the first part. And we're glad that the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, by himself took and bare and carried the sins of the whole world, his own body on the tree. He couldn't do that unless he was perfect God, as well as perfect man. Perfect God couldn't do it. That's why God had to have the incarnation. During the virgin birth of Christ, without any human father, without human blood, that he could take the blood and die for us and through his shed blood, brought by the Father for the sins of the world, that that's the purpose why he came. And we're glad for that. We're glad that that was the way he came, and by himself, by himself alone, could bear our sins. And all these other things that people add, church after church, some apostate Baptist churches, some apostate Presbyterian churches, apostate Congregational churches, Roman Catholic churches, all these other Episcopal churches, they add and subtract and take away. But it's just by himself, the Lord Jesus, and he wanted to come, and he asked the Father in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, if thou be with me, if you want me to be with you where I am, I will, but nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. The Father's will was for him to go to Calvary, and to Calvary he went. Not for himself, the joy that was set before him, the genuine believers that trust him genuinely in their hearts and know that he died for their sins, might be in heaven with him for all eternity. That's the joy that was set before him in the future. Let's close in a word of prayer. To Heavenly Father, we do thank thee for this precious Savior that is at thy right hand, seated. His work is finished. It's a finished work. We thank thee, Lord, that he stood up when Stephen the, mar the martyr was put to death and stoned by cruel people. And Saul and Paul Watching it all, I'm sure it had a, an impression upon him. I'm sure that it used him. But we're glad the Lord Jesus, when he died, he was standing. And Stephen saw him standing at thy right hand. We thank thee, Lord, for sending a great Savior. We thank thee for our Savior that is seated there, work being finished, interceding for genuine us, us who are Christians, praying for us. We may live for him and serve him and not ourselves and not the world, not our flesh. We thank you for these visitors that have come. 
We hope that they will stay with us, that we'll that we eat with us, and come back if they can at 1.30 for our Bible study and the book of uh, Romans. We don't know whether they can stay or not, but we thank you for the, their being here. We pray that I must be with them, guide them, direct them, give them safety as they proceed back to their houses and back to their states where they live. We pray for this service that they have for the 95-year-old mother. What a wonderful year to be in. My wife has only four more years to make that. I have five more years. But we thank you for this. I hope she's genuinely saved. hope she knows the Lord Jesus as her Savior. We don't know. Guide them and direct them as they go. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Let's take our hymnals again. Turn to